So is this something that tattooers should be like re realistically worried about? Is this going to affect our job? Thanks for joining me for another episode of Books Closed. I'm Andrew Stortz, and on this episode, we're going to be talking about the news of an ink ban in Europe. Two ink pigments, Blue 15 and Green 7, which are found in an array of tattoo ink colors, uh, they're being banned. They are supposedly not safe to be tattooed into humans. And who determined they're unsafe, we're still not exactly sure. And uh, it's there's a lot of confusion surrounding all of this, I've found. And I know that here in the States, there's not a lot of regulation as far as tattoo ink goes. So we kind of feel like we're safe and it's kind of like the Wild West. But I think it's naive to assume that that will continue forever. There's been a lot of talk in the last week or two about this ink ban and uh, the implications uh, that, it, that come with it, what it could mean for the future, and how these sorts of regulations could be found in other countries outside of Europe. I'm seeing all the expected petitions. Saw a live stream and some videos from uh, Mario Barth, who owns Intense Tattoo Inks. And he's really trying to pull a rabbit out of his hat to make some change as far as this ink ban goes, because that's really going to affect ink companies. So it's it's no mystery that someone in his position would be very uh, tuned into this sort of ban. So what I wanted to do was talk to someone who had more knowledge than me about this topic, which probably isn't too hard to find. With the help of past guest of the show, Hannah Wolf, who was on episode 34, Scientific Tattooing, where we also were discussing tattoo ink, uh, she linked me up with Selena Medina, who's today's guest. And Selena is the manager for compliance and education for Body Art Alliance. She works with world famous tattoo ink and other related brands. And she's very deep into the science side of tattoo ink as well as the manufacturing side of it. And she's just generally tuned into the, the legal side of all these discussions that surround tattoo ink safety. I also don't want to neglect to mention that Selena is a tattooer. So she's got a very unique perspective on this whole topic since she has expertise on most sides of uh, what we're gonna be talking about. So we discussed uh, about how she got into really digging into the science behind all this stuff. Uh, some recommendations she has, what she thinks the future will hold for these ink bans and how it's going to affect our industry, how it's going to affect tattooers specifically, how it'll affect the manufacturers of these products and beyond. So here we go. Let's. But before we get started, I need to make sure that I mention the quest that I'm on. And if you've been listening to the last few episodes, you know that I am on the quest to get Fred Durst on this show. And if you aren't familiar with this quest, Fred Durst was a tattooer in the 90s and also just a general tattoo enthusiast, probably up until present day. And I would very much like to have him on the show to talk about that heyday, that classic, beautiful golden age of tattooing that people uh, think so longingly and lovingly about. So if you know a way that I can reach Fred, or if you can share this with him, if you know him, please do. I'd love to talk to him. And I've been able to have some conversations with people who were in similar circles and knew friends of friends or band mates or, you know, people in Jacksonville back in the day. I had a nice conversation with tattooer Jeremy Swed about the good old days of Fred Durst in Florida. Uh, I mean, occasionally, like on a lucky day, man, you can catch people with some, you can catch some people around with Fred Durst tattoos still. Like it's a pretty, you know, like older, the older crowd, like people I know, like in their forties and stuff, it's easy to catch them. Like there's that Chris that worked here for a long time, our old piercer. Like he has a, he had, he, to me, he has the best Fred Durst tattoo ever. It's a, it's just like a, you know, a mom heart, but it's like kind of fancy and like kind of graffiti-esque. But for that yeah. time frame in the nineties, that was the cool, the cool thing to, to do. And so I always, you know, like whenever like Olympus or the name Fred comes up, I'm always like, yo, Chris, show him your tattoo. And like, oh, <laughs> shit, man, really? And I'll share more of the conversation and others with you very soon. But that's just a little bit to wet your whistle. So please help me out. Help me get in touch with Fred Durst. Please, please, please. I'm not joking. Please. All right, here we go. Let's get started with the show. I think you 
did a podcast with Hannah, didn't you? Hannah yep. Wolf. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I met Hannah um, pretty much from my interest around tattooing and really having a lot of questions about what what happens, what goes into tattooing, what are we physically putting into people's bodies. And I had had, like a lot of tattoo artists, I'd had a couple reactions that were pretty serious um, that actually scared me to a point where I was like, whoa, what is this? Why does this person have a tattoo that's not healing? Well, what's really in the pigment that's causing this? Insert going down a rabbit hole. Um, I took classes from the Alliance for Professional Tattooists Association uh, a few years ago. Uh, I think it was like back in 2016 or so. Um, not all that long ago, but enough to kind of make an impact. And then that's when I started learning, okay, well, there's a difference between inorganic pigment and organic pigments and where those sources come from. And then, you know, we started dealing with, okay, well, there's FDA warning letters where they're saying shit about tattoo pigment here. Well, there's stuff going on over in Europe. And insert fast forward a few years, I started working for World Famous. Well, the main reason why I started working for World Famous is because I like how they manufacture their pigments. And then you start getting into comments and questions about, well, why is the pigment different? Well, the pigment's different because quality control metrics are applied to it. So I think an important thing that a lot of tattooers may not be aware of is personal care cosmetic products are what tattoo inks are legally under. So here in the United States, we're required to post what's in our tattoo pigment. Um, that's a law under the Fair Labeling and Protection Act. Uh, we're also required to label them appropriately, which is under Title 21 uh, of the FDA. And then you have the European registration or legislation products. That's a whole other animal in itself because they've actually taken the time to start looking at tattoo inks and paying much more attention to what's in the pigment. Now, the United States is probably about eight to 10 years behind what's going on in Europe. So when we see what's going on in Europe, in our culture here in the United States, we're very curious. Like, why are they outlawing pigments over there, but we might be using that shit here? Like, where's the mess in the gap? Well, the mess is that in the European Union, they don't have standardized testing that concludes that a product is either unsafe, mutagenic, uh, to tatrogenic, which is altering of DNA or um, birth defects or weird shit like that, they say all of these claims, they say all of this in the Etch of Guidance documents, which I'll kind of talk about in a minute. But the main thing about that is they're saying these pigments have a problem, but they can't provide the scientific data that states here's what the actual problem is. Because there's seven to eight different testing facilities over in the EU and nobody's on the same page. Nobody can say, well, this pigment's a problem, this pigment's not a problem, this one's questionable, et cetera. So how do they know that there's an issue if they can't even pinpoint exactly what it is? Well, because one test in one country, say in like Italy, said that, okay, well, this particular pigment has heavy metals in it. Well, in Germany, that's not the case. They said that the pigment's safe. So depending on who's talking, and who's putting this through to the authorities is gonna dictate who's really winning. And nobody's winning in this case. Right. Because it's, let me, let me go off into the weeds here for a second and I'll, I'll bring it back. Let's go. So tattoo ink is terribly difficult to scientifically break down and say it's going to affect you by the following means. Okay, the only way to do that is using something that has a lymphatic and adrenal system, um, a filtering system and like a kidney type of like system. Well, you can only do that by animal model testing. We don't support that. Our company does not support that. We don't believe in cruelty to animals. We don't support those kind of claims. So you have the European Union who's saying, okay, well, we need more concrete testing 
but we don't believe in animal testing. Okay. Then you have Oregon on a chip where they're testing these products, but the testing, testing on that and the data coming back from it is inconcurrent. So this is where there's a gap and there's a miss. Now, explain what organ on a chip is for people. Organ on a chip is that it is skin cell, organ tissue, live tissue, or human replicated DNA or data that is transferred onto a synthetic device where it is done in the sense of advanced toxicological screening and testing. So they expose that sample to as much of the product as they possibly can and work from a reverse engineering backwards to state that it's either testing above that toxicity rating, that it's not safe, or below screening of that toxicity rating and saying that it is safe. Make sense? Got it. Cool. So in the hot button topic right now, talking about blue 15 uh, and green seven, I think, I think those are the ones. I look at color every single day, so you'll have to forgive me if I get the numbers messed up. I have dyslexia, so sometimes it kind of fucks me up. But on, on the colorants and what they're actually talking about here, they're trying to push this thing and they're saying, hey, stop, we can't use them. But they don't have the information that states that these aren't safe. So that's where we're kind of at a miss. Really, this doesn't entirely affect tattooing. This affects the manufacturing of the products. So you have large organizations and large companies that work on preemptive testing, preemptive screening, and now what we're starting to do is destructive metals testing and destructive testing on the pigment itself, the raw powder that's responsible for the color. We test it before it even goes into the formula and we're able to trace those products and we're able to say, okay, this product is safe or this product is not safe. Now, the ways in which we screen for that is through a company called CTL. This is actually what is, is plastered on our bottles. We have CTL, EU compliance, um, BVL licensing, the, the entire litany. Any major pigment manufacturer is responsible for having and maintaining those certifications. So CTL has now decided to step in with what's happening with RACEAP and these additional safety concerns. And they're saying, hey guys, let's pause it for a second. Test it first and then test the finished product. So now that's what we're doing. We've included that into our process of the way that we are making sure that our products are safe for consumer use and for tattoo artists, because we wanna make sure that you have good safe products that you can pick up off the shelf and tattoo your people with, not be concerned with. This is this is a manufacturing thing. So do you think so? There is ink that like you can manufacture ink that will uh, will like meet all these requirements when it comes down to it. Yeah, so, absolutely. So, so why why aren't people doing that? Is it a lack of care, or is it just cheaper and easier to do certain things differently, or like what is the root of of an ink that wouldn't meet the standard? If the ink fails to meet those standards, it's because either the sourcing of their ingredients, they are having a hard time getting a good source. Um, so that's, that's topic number one with the pigment. Um, the carrier solutions that make the pigment viscous and actually tattooable and into an ink, those carrier solutions may be flagged in that same sense because they're having problems with sourcing those ingredients and they may possess some of the problems. Um, an additional source that could make it difficult is they don't have the right testing or they're failing like microbiological testing of the post product. So that's another one of the concerns that's in there. Uh, and then the last one is sometimes they run into issues manufacturing it. So, and when you're talking about manufacturing, because you gotta remember, Tattoo ink is usually made in very large vats and you have people that manually have to in introduce the product, they have to mill it, they have to refine it, they've got to clean it, you know, all, all of those types of things. Well, we're using raw earth minerals in some cases and we're using synthetic products. It just depends on what the blend is, what's going on, you know, all of those kind of things, they're a factor. Well, human hands have to touch the product from point A all the way up until the point that it gets put in the bottle. So there's room for error. 
So for us, we just changed how we're doing business and how we have set up our sanitation pr protocols to ensure that that product has minimal interaction with humans, that there's little to no room for error, there's not things being introduced into it. Those are all concerns when you're making pigment. So let's talk a little bit about what, what all these articles we're seeing about the European ban is specifically. Um, is this something that's already in effect? No. Um, so we have two years. Um, the, we say two years because it was actually put through at the middle of last year. So with it being pushed into now, um, the date of it being assumed is the beginning of 22. So I, you have to forgive me. I have to read so much of this paperwork. So sometimes the, the stuff gets a little crazy. But the beginning of 22, we've already been planning for this. We've already been working towards it. We've already known, you know, l let's be real about something here. There are other industries who have had to go through this before us. It's not just tattooing. This is not just a tattooing problem. They are just now looking at tattooing because tattooing is problematic. But other industries like the cosmetics industry have gone through things like this. The hair industry has gone through things like this. The food industry, all of them. They're all subject to changes happening. The more that you increase the popularity of something, you have more people that are getting this, this product or these sets of products that eventually at some point in time, those quality standards have to go up to ensure public safety. So that's what Europe's doing. Now, I think that Europe is shooting from the hip and speaking from a place of fear, and they're not really going about it the right way. But truly, if, if I can see science that says that those colorants are a problem, then I'll, I'll sign off on it and say, okay, then we need to find something else. But because those products are actually being put into question now, we're like, okay, well, as a company, we want to make sure that our people are safe. So how do we do that? We look for other means. That's common business practice. It's not terribly common to go in and change the formula of any kind of ink because it is a lot of work to go through and actually test all of those products. But in reality, you have to be prepared for those kind of business decisions when you are an ink manufacturer. So is this something that tattooers should be like re realistically worried about? Is this going to affect our job? No. The reason why you should actually want this, and there's a couple of major reasons why you would want this. Number one is it means that you're going to have safer products because those safer products are going to assure that by these laws and these legislations, they're strictening, they're making stricter standards. So manufacturers have to abide by a higher standard. That's a good thing, in my opinion. Yeah, the definitely. second part of that is, too, is that they're required to actually screen those products before they get put into the formulation. That's an even better thing because all that does is just prove the legitimacy and the safety of the product. Third, you have larger, you have larger pools of data and larger pools of pieces of information that make it where we understand what's going on with these products. We understand where these products are going into the body. We understand how they affect the human health and the human condition. Because without humans, we don't have tattooing. We have to touch people. We have to put tattoo ink in human bodies. So in order to make sure that it's safe, we have to be asking those types of questions. Fourth, tattoo artists will actually be able to go and pick a product up off the shelf and they're not gonna have to spend time like I've done in sitting in the weeds and learning all of this information the hard way. There are other people like myself that work at these tables to make sure that we are able to provide safe quality products so it's easier for you to do your job and you have a better performing product. So in my mind and in my opinion and from the standard of our opinion as a company, we believe that this is a good thing because it's just gonna make our products better and prove more legitimacy within an industry. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just going to actually kind of make people follow through with the stuff that I think a lot of tattooers are assuming is already happening, or at least we're just letting ourselves believe that. Um, I know when I talked to Hannah last season on the show, it was like, it's definitely, I can understand the like the earth shattering truths that can be told to people when you actually know, uh, you know, know a lot of the specifics, like both of you know uh, about all this stuff. Um, and it really made me think a lot about what I was using and, um, 
and all that stuff. And it, it, it was kind of like a mini crisis. I remember I was flying home after that and I was just thinking about like all the tattoos I've done <laughs> and all the ink, like certain inks that she told me specifically were like, whoa, never use that. That stuff's crazy. And I'm just thinking like, holy fuck, I've tattooed 2000 people with that, including my, I have it in myself. So it's just, it's a weird thing with tattooing because the damage is done for many years for a lot of us. But, but, but is it really damage? I don't know. Cause everyone's fine I think right it's now. A, I think it's just a learning thing yeah. at this point. Like, I don't really think it's damage because truthfully, when did we really know? You know, when did we spend the time and when did we when did we come to a place of understanding as an industry where we could meet science, not by an adversarial means, but actually meet it and greet it and welcome it? Because to me, I welcome the interest of science in this because that just means that we're able to legitimize the industry and we're able to protect people that, you know, I, I believe very strongly of do no harm. I follow very closely with the medical industry and I have a lot of ties to the medical industry beyond just manufacturing. So, you know, when I look at it from like a medical standpoint, it's like, I don't want to do harm to hurt people. I want to make sure that we make better products. You know, for me, I had like this crazy existential crisis when I found out some of this stuff and like my life went on pause and I really was like, I can't. I, I can't know about this stuff like I do and not do something about it because these people, and I look at tattoo artists as my peers or my friends that I haven't met yet. I don't want my friends to lose their jobs, their livelihood, their businesses, and not be able to provide for their families because this culture is amazing and beautiful and that should be preserved at all cost. And if we can use science and legislation and regulation to actually work towards that, I think that we're working to a better industry because that's going to be able to preserve the legacy of tattooing because it's, it's much more. And I think everybody that listens to your podcast can understand and know that tattooing is much deeper than just being ink and just being a pretty picture on somebody's skin. Like, you know, for me, like I grew up around tattoo artists like Miss Deborah and she learned from Paul Rogers. And, you know, I spent a lot of my my very early childhood looking at people doing tattoos without gloves on. Like, I, I remember those days. And I've been tattooing for 20 years, so I remember all the steps in between now. So for me, I'm actually quite happy about it and seeing like, wow, we can actually meet science and chemistry in this and we can make a good product. I mean, some people may not be aware of this, but machine learning was actually used to develop the coronavirus vaccines. Now, what they did was they used machine learning to actually track the algorithm of the way that the, the virus would replicate itself and change and adjust so that it would be future-proof against any of the new strains. Well, that same type of science can be applied to many other different things. And when you start talking about things like chemistry and color science and all of that, you can apply some of those same tools to color and chemistry. So we have yet to make new pigments. We've yet to make some of those things. I think that that's within the scope of possibility because the, the future of science really is here now. And we're starting to really just kind of crack the surface on that. And I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah. And it seems like that's the only way that this can work long term at this point. We can't just pretend that we're like this niche, special, magical thing that we're like science doesn't apply. And a lot of people like to think that. And you can point back and say, well, there haven't been huge issues. And maybe that's true. But as the industry is growing and compounding and there's, you know, tons of manufacturers, tons of tattooers, tons of customers. Um, yeah, it, it seems like the only way that we can't ignore that. And I agree that I think it's a, a huge plus that we've got the resources and that there are these companies that are big enough um, that are able to look deeper into it and kind of refine the, the manufacturing processes and everything. Yeah, um, I was really excited to um, be a part of that. Um, I had worked with APT for a few years. They went to Professional Tattooist Association. I was one of their board members and I uh, had taken a couple classes from them about pigment. And when I started understanding what was pigment, I started asking a lot of questions. And shortly thereafter, I met Hannah and became included in her book project, um, The Science of Tattooing. If anybody has not picked that up, that is the best, most comprehensive textbook that explains how tattoo ink works and how it works in the skin and at what truly makes a tattoo permanent. That, that really is the most comprehensive manual for that. So for me, when I got the opportunity to go from 
working with Hannah to actually working in the manufacturing division and developing these products, it's like, yeah, why the fuck wouldn't I want to be included in that? I want to preserve our industry. Like, uh, science is the future, man. Like, and now, you know, I, I kind of say this like loosely, but at the same time, like it is a very true, true thing. Science shouldn't be something that you just elect into. It shouldn't be something that you just, oh, okay, I'll sign off on it. You should be able to go and research this stuff yourself and read the concrete facts and actually read the data and kind of like look at it. I, I don't know if anybody has really spent the time and looked at it, but I can share the link with you for like the actual, the etch like write up, like what the legislation says itself so they can read it themselves. But also like, you know, go on the National Institute of Health, go and research some of these pigments, go and research some of this stuff yourself, spend the time. But if you don't want to spend the time, feel free to pick up Hannah's book, look at her book and, you know, contact me or her or contact your ink manufacturer, ask them questions. Most of the times they're gonna be interested in what you have to say because you're the person that buys their products. And that was the case for me and Lou. Um, Lou Rubino is the owner of world famous uh, Permablend. Kirosumi, um, Ultimate Tattoo Supply, I mean, God, he, he's got a bunch of different companies. And, you know, I, I asked him, I was like, hey, dude, I'm like, I'm having an existential crisis here. Like, I don't really understand. Like, am I hurting people? Like, did, did I do something wrong? And he was like, well, no, nobody really did. We're all learning as we go through this. And, you know, science, science has come to the fold and we have access to it now. And I think that's pretty amazing because it just means that the other tattooers that come behind us are going to have a much clearer cut path. I, I don't know about you, but I didn't really have that clear cut of a path when I made my entrance into this industry. But I think that now we've gotten through a lot of the hiccups that fixing that one part of our supplies, that's a big one. And that's a good thing. Definitely. I'm just wondering if there's going to be a way I can return those 300 bottles of green and blue ink that I just ordered. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, <laughs> We're that stocking hurt. up like toilet paper. I, you know, I already had a customer this week ask me, because they had read a, an article about uh, about the European ink ban, uh, asked me like about blue and green, if their blue and green tattoos are going to be an issue. And I, didn't, I, just, I just said no, but I didn't know. <laughs> it didn't seem like any, uh, I don't know. I never if know what to think when I really that truly shit. that worried about it, I mean, they can go seek like a medical professional and have some type of testing done, but usually that involves a biopsy and things that hurt really fucking bad. And might yeah. I suggest that is not the way to go. <laughs> um, you know, I've done it. I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, like, you know, we have to understand that you know, as we're, as we're going through this, it is an adult decision for somebody to get a tattoo. Now, I do think that maybe tattoo ink should come with some type of like a warning letter or not really like a warning letter, but maybe like similar to how like cigarettes are labeled. Like, yeah, okay, we all understand, but I don't even think that's necessary now. And it might be in the future. You know, it just doesn't seem like it's the same kind of threat yet, or at least that we can even pinpoint. So what are we even warning of? This thing could be a bad thing. Maybe like you could put that warning on anything. That is why I say it's science. You're subject to change your opinion at any time when you're right. presented with more data or more, more conclusive evidence that states that this is a problem right now. I don't see a problem with this other than we're just changing things as a manufacturer to make sure that our products are safe and our customers are safe. Well, I feel a lot better now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I, I wish I wish I could say like I wish I could say like how many people have like pulled me inside and like asked me about this and it's just been like you know what I'm I'm gonna do it one time I'm gonna talk to Andrew I'm gonna go on this this books closed podcast and hopefully it'll alleviate some concerns for some people but I do think that in the future you know maybe there should be like some courses kind of like explaining like this is how tattoo ink is manufactured these are the things that we have to look for. You know, maybe something like that or like additional, you know, additional follow up like talks or lectures about that may be necessary. But I think that the American and, and let me be clear about this one. I think American artists are now starting to come to the conclusion where they're going, what the fuck is this? Like, is this really happening right now? You know, over in Europe, this has been happening for more than 10 years. So they're just kind of like, eh, whatever. It's old news to them. But 
for us here, it's a little bit new. So it's not saying that we haven't been doing our job, not at all. We just didn't know that that was something that we really needed to look at. I know me personally, it wasn't until I had been tattooing for at least 15 years that I really started paying attention to it. So at that point, then it was like, okay, I have a bunch of concerns and I have a bunch of questions, but you know, people like myself and Hannah, we've decided to really take that and kind of like push a little bit further forward and say, yeah, we're going to take ownership on some of these things. We are going to work on this, you know, so for, you know, industry folks who are still tattooing today, you can kind of identify the folks that you can ask questions like, Hey, I'm here. You know, I want people to feel like they have some product assurance and that they are confident in their products, they're confident in the quality of their products, and they also have confidence to continue to go and tattoo and make beautiful pieces of artwork. That's just kind of been my, my thing with it. Do you think if all of these standards are raised to the level that they need to be, um, is that going to kind of push out the little guy like the smaller companies? I hope not. I really don't want the smaller manufacturers to get left by the wayside on this, but... Like, is it a money thing? No, I don't really think it's a money thing. I mean, there is money in ink, but it's really not the amount of money that people think it is. It's not. Um, it's very... I mean, like, the money it would take to, to like, get themselves to the level of, uh, like, getting certified and getting all that stuff, would, it, would the cost be too great for a smaller company to be able to, like, bring their operation to that specific level? No. I don't think so. I don't. Um, the reason why I say that is because it would require, it would require like clean sanitation areas and they can be expensive. Um, filtered water and probably a couple of other different things that would need to happen. I don't think it's ex a cost exorbitant type thing. I do think that if to a certain point, it may be cost inhibitive for some people. I don't think that small batches of pigment should really be a thing anymore with as much speculation as going on with this, because I'm, I'm going to say something about the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room is when you manufacture pigment, if there is a problem with that pigment, you're the one assuming liability, but the liability falls between the artist and the pigment manufacturer. So if your standards are not to a certain level, then you're gonna wind up being the one that assumes that liability. So it's important to kind of understand that. There are other industries that have well-defined and predefined what personal care and cosmetic standards should be. So when you're looking at industries that maybe have some comparable things to Tattoo Inc., it's important to kind of note that. So even at the base level, of somebody manufacturing soap, they have certain quality control measures that are in place that must be observed. And one of which would be filtered water systems or closed induction systems, or maybe like airless bottle injection or weird shit like that. Because what that does is that proves that that product is made safely and it's made in a sanitized fashion that it's not gonna cause any more problems. The same should be said about tattoo ink. So if you're unable to meet those types of standards, making tattoo ink might not be in your best interest. Now, I'm not the person to make that decision. I am saying that's something that should be evaluated as your business plan if you are making tattoo ink. Got it. Yeah, I know it's a big one. <laughs> Time to hang up the blenders, everybody. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, guys. Like, you know, I get it. Um, I, I have so much love for the people that made Tattoo Ink many, many, many years ago. And some of my first memories of tattooing were of watching people make Tattoo Ink with blenders and, you know, using Everclear. And <laughs> for us here in Florida, it was very simple for us to just drive like over the Florida Georgia line and go pick up like six bottles of Everclear and come home and make Tattoo Ink for like, you know, a weekend. <laughs> Because, you know, it's like Memorial Day, like before Memorial Day weekend, and we know that we're going to have this crazy rush of people like coming from like South Carolina or like up from the center part of the state. And, oh, my God, we got to have Tattoo Inc. Like, let's hustle. Let's move, you know. But on the same sense, like, you know, back then we didn't really know that this could be a problem. 
and could cause that kind of type of problem for people and might be an issue. So now knowing what I know about the issues that can result from tattoo ink, I personally wouldn't want to be the one that assumes that liability and that risk. And I do think that it should be evaluated into a business concern for anyone who is a tattoo artist who may make ink still. Because I know that there's a ton of people out there doing it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a little, a little Easter egg out there. If you're making your own tattoo ink and it doesn't cross state lines, well, that's just kind of your own thing. But, you know, I don't it's not my thing. I don't, I don't make tattoo ink other than working for the manufacturer. So if that's something that you as a person see to do, make sure you do your due diligence, understand what it is that you're making. Um, definitely vet the supplies that you're making and try to provide the best quality product that you can. And then sell them like Girl Scout cookies locally. <laughs> right. <laughs> see if I had to guess what would be the one like uh, challenging statement people would make after hearing something like this. If, if I've learned anything from enduring uh, responses to things I've said on this podcast for the last couple of years, I could hear people saying, oh, so you guys want more government regulation and tattooing. Cool. So what would you say to that? Um, my biggest rebuttal to that is going to be without that kind of regulation, you're going to continue to compete with scratchers and unqualified people making your products that you may be depending upon and those products may inevitably fail. Shots fired. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, well, I'm a hell of a marksman anyway, so that's fine. <laughs> no, that's that's an interesting way to look at it. And hopefully people with the opinion that I just assumed they might have, they can think about it from another side as well. Yeah, I, and I'm sure that there's going to be some of that that comes out of it. And I, I know it's not popular. I know it's not something that people want. And frankly, it, I don't want anyone telling me what the fuck to do. But honestly, like, I don't really like the government. And I found myself in a highly political position doing this because I don't like it. I don't like the way that things go down. I don't agree with the way that laws can be shifted and changed in this country. And I took it personally because it was fucking with the thing that I cared about the most and that's tattooing. So, you know, the fact that I don't like politics and the way that I don't like the way that judicial process works in this country gave me enough firepower to say, you know what, fuck this. Uh, if, if something's going on in my industry, I need to fucking know about it and I'm gonna do something about it and hopefully fix it and make it where it's better for everyone. It's not just a me thing, it's about we. Look at the labeling, pay attention to how it's actually listed. Um, look at the certifications that are on the label, you know, and if you have a question and you're not sure what that label says, contact the manufacturer, just contact them. You'd be surprised at how many emails that we get about just little things like, what does BVL mean? You know, just, just little things, just send us an email, send us an email, you know, check out our products. Um, you know, and hopefully um, this becomes more of an, a known conversation and more of a known topic. And uh, I invite the conversation itself. And I do hope that, you know, in the future, we'll be able to maybe work together and share some more stuff. But uh, at, at the close of this, uh, I would like to give you like a document that people can track the stuff themselves by their lot, their batch and their date coding yeah. to make sure that their products are good and safe. It doesn't matter which manufacturer it comes from. They all have to have that on them. And if they don't, then that's a problem. Yeah, I'll include a link to that in the show notes for anyone who's interested. And I think that'd be a great resource. Yeah, definitely. So, hey, thanks. This was very cool. <laughs> You're welcome. Sorry to blow your mind a little bit, Andrew. I, I wasn't really sure to know like how much to talk about. Hannah just like sent that message and I, I had no idea that that was going out. And I was like, oh, so there's this thing that I've been working on for the last like five years and now I have to talk about it in front of people. What? This is it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. I feel like I'm back in school. I feel like I'm sitting in a classroom right now. 
I didn't. I really didn't want it to turn out like that. I'm sorry. There's I don't mean it in a bad way. It's no, it's a not a bad thing. Time. It's just that you. I think we all have a responsibility. We got to buckle down and learn some shit, as you know, and, and the benefits that you can get from doing that. It, it might hurt to learn things, but you know, I think we can all handle it. I'm going to cover myself in band aids for the rest of the day. Oh, buddy. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. No, I think it's. I, I, I truly, I, I joke, but I like to think uh, that this is a really important thing, and I hope that more people can get on board with it and not just have the idea of, well, the stuff that I, that I use is what people use forever, and it's okay. Like, that'll only get you so far. I, I don't think. I don't think that's a good point of logic. Just because we've been doing something forever doesn't mean that we should continue to do it, especially when we have the information and the resources that can bring us to an advancement. And there's plenty of other examples elsewhere in life that have proven that sort of thinking to not be beneficial. <laughs> so let's not pick that. and choose. <laughs> that let's not, let's not do that anymore. Like, um, and I get it, man, I get it. There's going to be a lot of people that have problems with this and there's going to be a lot of people that really don't want this to be reality. But you know, when you start talking about things that affect public health, it, it is a concern and it is something that does need to be addressed. And I do think that, the ethical companies that really give a shit about their customers are the ones that are applying resources and, and time to make sure that those products are safe, but they're also using the other resources from other industries and applying them to their inks to make sure that they're making the best stuff possible. You know, And I think that you know, if you spend a little bit of time, just as a, a tattoo artist sitting in your office or sitting in your studio or in your booth, and you look, you know, you can just kind of search on the internet. What, is, what does this company do? What's the benefit of me buying this ink? It's not just a matter of, I like the color anymore. How is that product made? Ask the questions. And if you're not sure, there are people like me that are around. Hannah's around, I'm around. Go buy Hannah's book. I'm, I'm not just saying it from like a point of, hey, you need to go buy my friend's book. I, I, I take no profit in that. I have nothing to do with that. It is strictly under the connotation of that is one of the most comprehensive tools for understanding about Tattoo Inc. It's a great book. Yeah, and it really should be in every studio. And any, any newer artist or even any older artist who wants to understand more about the context of what it is that we're talking about here, pick the book up. Um, it's empowering to have that sort of knowledge I found when I got the book. Yeah, it, it is because suddenly these types of topics become a lot less scary. And then you go, wow, there are people out there really giving a shit about this. Okay, cool. I understand where I'm going to put my money. I understand why I'm going to buy this product from this person versus that. So it's, it's a thing, man. Quality's in the recipe. Pay attention to who you're buying your ink from. And also, please, for the fucking love of God, stop buying tattoo products on goddamn Amazon. <laughs> oh, that doesn't help the situation um, at all. <laughs> yeah. Buy from manufacturers. I want to thank Selena for being on the show this week. That was a hell of a lot of information. And uh, she's full of more of it. So if anybody has any questions, if you want to further this conversation, if you want to become part of the conversation, feel free to let me know. And you can do that by calling the Books Closed voicemail line, 857-444-0662. Leave a voicemail. And if we get enough questions or comments, then maybe I'll have Selena back and we can just keep talking about all this stuff. You can also send me a DM, whatever works, or email me at andrew at booksclosed.com. But anyway... You can follow Selena on Instagram at Girly Tattoos. You can follow me on Instagram at Andrew Stortz, S-T-O-R-T-Z. And if you like the show, please leave a rating and review on iTunes. It really helps other people discover books closed. And I also want to mention that if you are interested in checking out any of the resources that Selena has provided for me so you can further your own education and awareness about the materials that you are using as a tattooer, or even if you're just interested in as a collector of tattoos, uh, what's actually going on with the stuff that's being jammed into your skin by a needle. You can go to booksclosedpodcast.com, find this episode, and I will have a link so you can check out all that stuff because it's very eye-opening. We'll be back next time. We'll talk some tats a little bit more. And until then, take care. I know you. I know you. I know you.